Welcome to the madness of housing in the United Kingdom. In this episode, we'll see how, with time and effort, we have created one of the most dysfunctional, misfiring markets in our nation's history. We'll talk the facts, figures and causes of the UK's housing crisis. This is Show Don't Tell, so let's get into it. House prices in the UK have reached incredible highs beyond even the pre-financial crisis peak. Houses are only purchasable through a combination of quantitative easing and rich parents who give money to their kids. High prices create political pressure and the government's response has been a large number of schemes focused around delivering affordable housing. But the economics of house building are the same as everything else. You have supply, you have demand and you have price. All else being equal, prices go up when demand increases and supply declines. But if costs haven't changed, higher prices have an automatic response. There's more profit available to those who deliver supply, which should incentivize more supply. But in contrast to what you would expect, house building has not recovered to the level achieved before the financial crisis. Why is this? Well, we can view supply as being delivered by two groups small house builders and large house builders. Small house builders, that is, companies who build less than 100 houses a year, have practically disappeared. In the 1980s, nearly half of all houses were built by small house builders. Although numbers were recovering prior to the financial crisis, today just 12% of houses are built by small house builders. That's a reduction of about 35,000 houses per year compared to before the financial crisis. Home building is dominated by large house builders. In fact, half of all houses are built by just eight companies. These large house builders trade on the stock market, which means their numbers are publicly available. So what do they tell us about UK housing? Well, comparing pre and post recession, most large house builders are building as many, if not more houses than they did prior to the financial crisis, which is what we would expect. However, with the decline in small house builders, it's not enough to deliver an overall increase. But let's look at the change in gross profit between pre and post recession. It's clearly increased. There is no lack of incentive for small house builders to build houses. It appears to defy logic, but there is an explanation, a barrier to entry. If something stops people from being able to deliver supply, those firms that can deliver supply capture all of the extra profit. It creates a completely separate market and that's exactly what we see in the UK housing supply. But how can there be barriers to entry to building a house? Building a house isn't complicated. You need three things, land, material and labour. That's it. Get all three things in the same place at the same time, you've created optimal conditions for building a house. We've already built about 28 million of them in the United Kingdom. It's not a lost art or a skill that disappeared through time. So why is it not happening? What stops small house builders? Well, the answer is a single word, planning. Land, material and labor isn't enough in the UK. You need to get the nod from the man and the man doesn't nod for free. You see, the system in the UK is built around planning permission. You need permission to build a house from your local authority. They're the man. Local authorities are councils, borough councils, district councils, town councils, the organizations that administer your everyday services, social care, bin collection, road repair, libraries, pub licensing, and so on. But local authorities are in a deep financial crisis. Their income is half council tax, which is the charges levied on houses and businesses in their boundaries, and half of their income comes from a central government grant. Over the last seven years, that central government grant has reduced by over 30%. Because the government wants local authorities to be more self-sufficient, or they're just cheap, who knows why exactly, but they are definitely doing it. The result is local authorities under a huge amount of financial pressure, because on the cost side, things are just as tough. The largest areas of expenditure for a local authority is adult and child social care, for which there's about as much enthusiasm to reduce as there is enthusiasm to raise council tax. So what's the significance for housing? 
Well, number one is the planning department. No one's manning the barricades to save the planning department, and spending on planning has reduced by 50% over the last seven years, more than any other area of expenditure, and this is at the time that we have a housing crisis. The other issue is the income the council needs to provide schools, libraries, and community centres. They don't have the money for it, so what do they do? Well, they need to get access to the people who do have some money, and as I said earlier, the only people who do have money are those able to buy a house at the current high prices. But how to get to these people? Well, salvation comes with the combination of large house builders and a piece of legislation with an innocuous name, Section 106. Now, I dislike Section 106 on principle. It's a tax, but unlike all other taxes in a modern economy, it's an arbitrary tax. There's no formula for how it's calculated. It's a multi-million pound tax individually negotiated by each local authority. There's no register, statistics, or any way of knowing when someone got a sweetheart deal because of corruption. This text is all there is. Section 106 was created for a simple enough principle. Local authorities could ask developers to contribute money if the council would bear costs as a result of any new development, like the cost of a new access road. Now, however, it's simply used as a tax for all the extra stuff councils require. The principle that Section 106 and community infrastructure levy charges would fund benefits for the actual development was completely abandoned. There is no proportionality or relevance to the actual development itself. This is where small house builders got put out of business. Large house builders can afford to give entire schools and hundreds of affordable homes. The need's especially true when you have a tiny, overworked planning department that needs to maximise their time. And this is the dark secret of many local authorities. They don't put up flags to celebrate it, but most new schools and libraries built since the financial crisis were constructed by house builders without any council involvement as a quid pro quo for getting planning permission on developments that could be situated miles from the infrastructure in question. This is show don't tell, so let's have an example of what I'm talking about. Here's a new building that I walk past most days, recently completed on Finchley High Street. It replaced a dilapidated office building with these two small towers. There are 77 flats, a shop on the ground floor of one building, and a library on the ground floor of the other. So what was demanded by the council to build 77 new flats in outer London? Well, the library, and I don't just mean a contribution, I mean the entire library. Fitting out the library space, £945,000 to the council, quarter of a million pounds in cash for all the computers, books and equipment to go inside, and finally the whole space leased back to the council for 125 years for the total cost of one pound. The value of the lease could be well over a million pounds, but even setting that aside, the library demand alone is fifteen and a half thousand pounds per flat. So an entire library paid for by 77 people because they could afford to buy a flat in outer London. But the library isn't the end of it, they also had to pay £470,000 in community infrastructure levy, which is a fixed rate per square foot on top of the Section 106 charges and all the other baubles that have been glued to planning legislation. Let's examine financial reports from the large house builders for more numbers. Chris Nicholson disclosed they are going to pay £79 million pounds for libraries and schools alone as a result of housing development alongside hundreds of millions of pounds for community facilities and affordable homes. Barrett and Persimmon say similar things about their building of schools and libraries. There are even architectural firms that offer Section 106 template schools, so that when you have to build a school, you have a cut and paste model ready to go. And so our vicious cycle turns. Local authorities under financial pressure demand large contributions of facilities and affordable homes from developers. Small builders can't provide these payments, so nowadays they're working on building extensions to existing houses. Housing supply doesn't recover, so house prices increase. There also aren't more new homes that make new council tax payments, which means there's more pressure to deliver affordable homes, and local authorities ask developers to make greater contributions, and round and round we go. The government's response is to spray out schemes and money for affordable homes, land, financing, 
everything else they can think of. It's an excellent demonstration of how, in a fundamentally flawed system, there is no end to the increasing complexity you have to add to get it closer to where it should be, because the alternative is to admit that the underlying system is fundamentally broken. These schemes create a new level of madness. That increase in gross profit for today's house builders that's after making around 20% of their homes affordable and paying other Section 106 levies. But as house prices are so high, the help to buy government scheme provides lending and guarantees so people can actually pay high prices. Today, 35% of the houses are paid for under these schemes. That's your tax money buying houses at the same time house builder profits are at all time highs. What a complete mess. There are other explanations for the housing crisis and I don't have time to go into why I believe what I've been speaking about is the most significant. The simplest answer is that if the issues were land or financing, then the schemes which target exactly those issues would have helped resolve the housing crisis, but they haven't, because in my view they're treating the symptoms rather than the underlying disease. In fact, amidst this plethora of schemes, we can find supporting evidence for my argument. Let's look at the Starter Home Scheme launched in 2016. The Starter Home Scheme tries to shortcut the vicious cycle with a nifty premise. Commission sort of affordable homes for first time buyers and you don't have to pay Section 106 or Community Infrastructure Levy. The catch is you have to sell these homes at a 20% discount to market value. What a profit for the lucky buyers. The National Lottery isn't struggling, it just changed the ticket price. And the building under this scheme is going ahead because the saving of no Section 106 is sufficient to make a profit even at 20% below market value. More significant are the legal developments. In 2013, central government changed planning rules to exempt small house builders from Section 106 charges. Sounds great, but what was the catch this time? Well, local authorities sued the government to prevent these changes from being implemented, and it spent the next three years in court, eventually reaching the Court of Appeal. One branch of the government using tax money to sue another branch of the government to use tax money to defend it. In October 2017, a local authority went all the way to the Supreme Court and lost, with the court stating that it was unlawful to restrict development until the developer contributed towards infrastructure which has no more than a trivial connection to the development. If there's one thing you remember from this episode, I hope it's this. Demands for Section 106 and affordable housing are not paid by developers, they are paid by the people who buy the houses. These demands are created through the high cost of housing caused by the very lack of development. It's not beneficial for food to be expensive just because some people own fields, and it's not beneficial for housing to be expensive just because some people own houses. Expensive housing simply means that people have to spend more and more of their paycheck on rent or mortgage payments for their homes. They have to live in smaller, lower quality and more distant houses than they would otherwise be able to live in. It creates 65 million people who have less money to spend on the things they actually want. Central government pays a huge cash price because it has to pay housing benefit to accommodate the needy and they have to pay rents for many claimants. That bill today is £25 billion a year. It's increased £5 billion from the same number of claimants as in 2010. You would think the opportunity to save £5 billion a year would be a pretty good incentive to fix the system. The failure of the government to create a system where people can construct and sell and build houses is a basic failure. If the house building system actually worked, the government would not have to spend a penny. If houses could be built and sold affordably, lower prices would make existing houses affordable, rather than specially constructed and doled out through a lottery. Using government money to build houses takes money from genuine public services like healthcare, education and defence, to do something that the private economy would be perfectly capable of delivering if it were allowed. There needs to be a full assessment of the system, patching over schemes hasn't worked and frankly will never work until these fundamental issues are addressed. I hope you enjoyed this video, this is Show Don't Tell and I'll see you next time.